In Fort Worth, every corner tells a story. From the historic stockyards, where the legacy of cowboys and cattle drives lives on, to the awe-inspiring beauty of the Botanic Gardens and the sights and sounds of the Fort Worth Zoo. We live in a city full of life and excitement. First United Methodist Church is proud to have called this city home for 150 years. Fort Worth has changed quite a bit in that time, growing from a small frontier town to now the 12th most populous city in America. First United Methodist Church has transformed alongside our home city as well. A culture of love, kindness, and hospitality is in the fabric of this city. It is who we are as a church too. We couldn't imagine a better place to live out our call to love God, serve people, and transform lives in the name of Jesus Christ. We can't wait to see what God has in store for the next 150 years. Good morning. Welcome. We are super excited you have joined us this morning. And because you are here in person, there are black pads that we would love for you to fill out and let us know that you are here. If you are joining us online, there is a platform online that we invite you to fill out and count your attendance. I'm Reverend Brenda Brooks Alexander. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Today, we continue our worship series that invites us to consider the qualities that will help us navigate the divisions we are experiencing in the world. This week, we consider compassion. Why do we need this quality more than ever now? Because we are complex beings living in a complex world. We sometimes deal with conflict within us in addition to the conflict between us. Research tells us because we are humans, are, de are desperate for a sense of cohesion and belonging in these confusing times. We are hanging on to ideological generalities instead of treating ourselves and each other with compassion that alleviates despair. Compassion grows when we are able to know ourselves and one another on a deeper level and act out our understanding. broken down the wall. Let us join our hearts as one. Christ has broken down the wall. We invite y'all to sing that with us. The words are up on the screen. Christ has broken down the wall. of simply coming together is revolutionary, which is its earliest form meant finding a course around a central point. We gather around the light of Christ as the center and guiding light of our lives. This becomes our point of reference for our relationships and our love for the world. This is our compassion revolution. Let us pray. Reconciling God, we ask you to help us open, be open to compassion. For we are a divided world and the conflict is raging even within us in this moment. Empower us and invite us to do unto ourselves and others in ways that build up your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus, the center that holds, and in the power of the Spirit that transforms. Amen. Would you please now rise in body or spirit and join me for the call to worship. We are accepted as we are. Cast aside your doubts and fears. Let us take a deep breath together. I inhale and the exhale. The rhythm of our breath and the heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and love is the same. Our desire for peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us. This peace is meant for all the people. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Amen. Let us pass the peace together. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you here. My name is Clint Church. I'm one of the worship leaders here at the gathering, along with the gathering band. We're going to start with a song called All My Hope. And uh, during this time of election season, sometimes it seems like we like to put our hope and our trust in other things. But this song declares that all of our hope is in Jesus. Amen? Let's sing this together. Here we go. Stranger 
You may be seated. This is our opportunity to share our prayers together. This is what we call prayers of the people. This is our time to talk to God, knowing that God hears and responds to our prayers. Throughout this prayer, you will hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, and your response is, hear our prayers. There will also be an opportunity for you to share the names on your hearts in this prayer, and we invite you to do that as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with humble hearts, asking that your spirit of compassion dwell deeply within us. As we lift our voices in prayer, let your mercy flow through every word, every act of kindness, every heart, and every intention of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We ask for your forgiveness for the times we have failed to love as you love us. Soften our hearts to reflect your love and teach us to love you as you love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are hurting, whether in body, mind, or spirit, grant them comfort. For those who suffer from illnesses and loneliness or grief, may they feel your healing presence through the care and compassion of others. Lord, in your mercy. For those in our congregation and those on our hearts, we lift those names up to you this morning for John, Becky, and Brenda, and Jonathan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others? Lord, in your mercy. For all who have gone before us in faith and for those whose lives were marked by acts of kindness and mercy, we give you thanks. May their legacy inspire us to live lives of compassion. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We invite our ushers to come now at this time. And as they are coming, we want to highlight our music ministry that is phenomenal on stage or in the choir loft, but also beyond the walls of the church. Last week, our choir packed 480 weekend meals for our Food for Kids program. That's a program that the mission does, and we partner with them. And they did a fantastic job. Over 200 kids are served in our Food for Kids program in the Fort Worth ISD uh, school, and we are just grateful to God for them. Thank you for your generosity in making that happen. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for the giving hearts in this place that help us to reach beyond the walls. Bless both gift and giver. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
sitting there shaking his head, writing you off, believing you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his head, wishing he'd never went to that. And he's not sitting there shaking his head, writing you off, believing you lost. And he's not sitting there shaking his head. Good morning, I'm Julie Compton. Um, and in this series, we're exam examining the news we take in and we share. We're looking for the really good news that can sustain us in the long haul. Together, we find ways to tell deeply good news for all people by filtering our interactions through the lens of compassion. Today's scripture is going to give us um, that impossible vision. Those who are enemies existing peacefully together. It is said that if we can envision something, we can work towards it. Can we believe in the vision that the scripture offers us of a way of being, full of the knowledge of God, instead of limited imagination and knowing? So our scripture today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. I invite you to read along with me from the Pew Bible. It will be on page 641 of the Old Testament, or you can read in your own Bible. But hear these words. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lay down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaning child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Julie. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to share words of gratitude and appreciation, specifically to the folks who were a huge part of Fall Kickoff Sunday, which we celebrated last Sunday. It was so great to see everybody at church. It was great to see all of the folks up in the academy classes. Uh, I shared with you all that I'm a volunteer at the Youth Refuge in the evenings from 5.30 to 7.30. I got to man the shooting gallery part of the activity uh, last week, which was excellent. Um, I This Sunday, I'm going to be teaching. Um, a lot of our youth might experience people in their lives in school or maybe even from other churches that want to tell them that faith and science are somehow incompatible and you need to choose between one or the two. And so I'm actually going to be speaking to the teenagers tonight, wanting to make sure that they understand that uh, those two things answer different questions and they actually work together in our understanding and growth and knowledge of God and love and creation. So I'm really thankful to be a part of all of that. I want to say a special word of gratitude to all the folks who were out on our Fifth Street celebration we had. We had sign-up opportunities for ministries all throughout the church, both inside the walls. I think 40 of you signed up to participate as lay readers and ushers and in other places of volunteering at the church. We also had other places to sign up, things like Meals on Wheels and Food for Kids and uh, Give Kids Hope and all these other places of outreach as well as adult Sunday school classes and small groups. All that stuff is still out this Sunday. If you would like to participate in that, make sure to check them out on your way out this morning. Also, I'm very excited to see the adoption rate that we had on the uh, Do Unto Others signs and t-shirts. I think at this count, we have pretty much given them all away because it's free, so the price was right. 
And I think we're at 600 yard signs and 500 t-shirts of all different kinds of sizes. So I'm really thankful that y'all adopted those and are excited to see them. Yeah, round of applause because it's a good thing that we're celebrating. And it's a great thing to have out there. I'm curious, have any of y'all had the experience of driving around your neighborhood and going, oh, I didn't know they went to our church. Have any of y'all seen that happen? Uh, I have not. So pray for my neighborhood because far north Fort Worth is deeply lost. Um, so we're going to keep working on them. Uh, we're not the only ones doing this sermon series, of course. I think I've mentioned that. A uh, thousand different United Methodist churches are doing it right now across the country. A thousand different Methodist churches. Some friends of mine, pastors in Sherman, pastors in Green, pastors in Houston, folks all over the place are doing this same message series because it's a message series that is relevant in all different places, all different states, all different contexts, urban rural, uh, all different kinds of uh, environments and where churches are serving and discipling people together. Talked a little bit the last few weeks about how a lot of research shows that people currently today find our experiences of the way we're talking to each other about things like laws and elections, et cetera, are just making people feel anxious and hopeless uh, and just really discouraged. And wherever there is anxiety and hopelessness and discouragement, that's where the church has some good news to share. And so that's why we're going through this. It's not a sermon series about politics. It's a sermon series about people, people who are hurting, people who are struggling, people who are feeling isolated, people who are feeling like they're stuck in an us versus them contest they never signed up for, and how we as individuals, we as families, we as communities, we as a church can offer a way towards real and actual healing. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've talked about kindness. We've talked about love as showing up for each other. I want to talk this week about compassion, the posture of compassion. And specifically, I want to talk about compassion as rooted in the willingness to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, right? The willingness to get outside of your own head and how you naturally think, think, uh, see things and think about things and experience things and be willing to be vulnerable and open to actually putting yourself in the shoes of other people, even if those shoes really, really don't fit you. And I think I've got a perfect example, and it came from a season where I was doing very, very deep and focused ministry research via Netflix. Anybody else do a lot of ministry research via Netflix? That's what I was doing. Um, my wife and I love documentaries. Anybody else love documentaries more than scripted shows? Like documentaries are my jam. If you have a documentary, recommend it to me. That's my love language. My love language is, have you heard of this documentary? That's what I love. And I love watching them. We just love documentaries. And this was a handful of years ago. I remember when it came out on Netflix. Y'all may remember it if you also gauge the passage of time via Netflix shows like we do. And it was a Netflix documentary about a community of people whose uniting factor, the thing that they all have in common that motivates a lot of their life decisions and shapes a lot of their community is that they are deeply, totally, and entirely convinced that the earth is flat. They are deeply convinced that the earth is flat. And this, as this documentary made clear, they have heard your science, right? They have heard your facts, they have heard your reflections. They, they've heard all the arguments, right? And at the conclusion, they are still very, very, very much convinced that the earth is flat. And they'd be happy to tell you why. And that's what this documentary was all about. These people who were very, very convinced and convicted and focused flat earthers. And it was a fascinating documentary and showed these people and how much this can create difficulties in their everyday life because anybody who has a very strong conviction that other people don't agree with that can create a lot of tension. At the same time, it formed a lot of community for them because they found someone else who shared those convictions. It was a fascinating documentary, but one thing, uh, I walked away with one thing from that documentary. There's one thing from that documentary that I walked away with that I have referenced over and over and over again. And it was a conversation that was taking place not by or among some of the very convinced flat earther people. It actually came from someone who I'll call a more traditional scientist. This person was a professional, credentialed, employed, traditional scientist, particularly when it came to astrophysics and cosmology and things along those lines. Um, as a side note, I watched a documentary about the U-2 uh, um, Air Force program. 
And uh, one of them, they have a patch on their, on their jackets that they wear, and it has a picture of the earth, and it says, not flat, we checked. And I think that's the funniest military patch I've ever seen in my entire flight. Not flat, we checked. Um, this was a, about a, this was a statement that was being made by a traditionally credentialed scientist. And he was talking to another group of, you know, traditional scientific people. And they had been talking about flat earthers and their convictions and their beliefs with a really consistent undertone or overtone of derision and mocking and teasing, putting them down, shaming them. They weren't there in president. They were having their own convention and gathering. They were doing so much mocking of these people who had these beliefs, right? And who weren't listening to their facts and weren't listening to their statements and weren't listening to their proof, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They were just mocking them. And then one of these traditional scientists stood up and he says, I get where this mocking is coming from. But when I see these people, when I see these people who really hold this conviction, what I see is a bunch of people who want to just take something that's been given to them and want to peel the curtain a little bit farther back. Don't want to dive in deep. That don't that want to do research. That want to test hypotheses. That are willing to pursue truth even if it costs them a great amount. He said, what I see in them is scientists. And the same things that they are, we are too. Now, of course, I don't believe where they've landed is accurate. However, I see in them the same good that has motivated you and me for our entire careers. So while I don't agree with their conclusions, I can respect who they are and how they've gotten to that place. And I think treating them with mockery and disdain and de, um, derision is not helping them, but it's also doing great harm to us. Wow. That's compassion. That's compassion. Now, does that mean that everyone gets to choose what shape the earth is based on their preferences? No. Some is more accurate than the other. However, that scientist was exhibiting a willingness to put himself in the shoes of another person, and to recognize what was good in their practices, what was meaningful in their perspective. He was willing to honor their desire to get to real truth, even if it led them to some other place that he couldn't agree with. Mocking derision gets us nowhere. Understanding, being willing to see and to hear, helps build a real bridge for actual communication. I've thought about that over and over and over again. Compassion is putting yourself in someone else's shoes and better understanding what their life is like. One of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had in actually developing compassion, walking in someone else's shoes, happened here at this church in a training session that we did. For those of you who aren't familiar, our church has four affiliated nonprofits. We have the day school for preschool age children. We have the First Street Methodist Mission, First Street in Henderson. We have the Methodist Justice Ministry, which provides legal aid for women and children who need no cost legal services. And then we also have Dementia Friendly Fort Worth. It's our newest nonprofit. You may not be as familiar with it. Dementia Friendly Fort Worth makes, uh, does efforts to equip and to serve people who have dementia and their caregivers. It also does a lot to raise awareness in the broader community about how to work with with and best serve people who are experiencing dementia and those who love them because that's a huge part of our shared life and our shared community. And one of the things that they do is they have training sessions so that a, uh, a person who doesn't have any of the symptoms of advanced aging or dementia can try to better understand what life is like if that's something you're working with. And so that was the training session that we went through here at the church. Dementia Friendly set it up for us. It was fascinating. It was in one of our Sunday school classrooms. And what happened is you waited in the hallway. And then Gail, the director of Dementia Friendly uh, Fort Worth, she got you ready. And one of the things she did was she put some kind of thicker, heavier gloves on your fingers that kind of helped simulate what it's like if you can lose a little bit of fine motor control and some dexterity as you age. So your hands have gloves on. She puts some kind of glasses on you that can... Uh, replicate what it is to have some astigmatism or some reduced clarity and eyesight that so many people experience in advanced age. And then the fascinating thing that I had never thought of is she put a pair of headphones over your ears. And in your right ear, it's playing a news broadcast, like what you would hear on the radio or on cable news. And that's playing in your right ear. And in your left ear is exactly the same thing, but a completely different broadcast. 
It's a completely different speaker on a completely different topic, a completely different tone. So you've got these glasses on, you've got these gloves on, and in your ears, you've got these completely different messages that are coming in interspersed with some tones and some beeps and things like that that are really disconcerting. This kind of mirrors what the neurological experience can be like of someone who has dementia. One of the things that she then does is kind of help you understand what it's like to actually try to communicate in the midst of this. And you still can communicate a little bit. You can communicate with someone pretty easily if they've gotten your attention, if they've stood right in front of you, and if they've spoken clearly and slowly enough that you can hear them through those challenges, you're able to communicate back a little bit. And when you go into the room, she has all different sorts of activities that are set up. There's puzzles, there's games, there's electronic devices, there's household chores like sorting cutlery or clothes. And you realize pretty quickly some of these are a lot easier and a lot more stimulating than others. And before you walk in, she gives you a job. But when she gives you a job before you go into that room, she gives it to you by standing behind you and just whispering kind of quietly. One of the things you may not know about me, because there's no reason for me to share it very often is I really struggle to discern voices out of the midst of noise. You know, like talking in a crowded room or a crowded restaurant or something like that. I really struggle to pick things out. So when she gave me instructions, I didn't even know that she was giving me instructions. I couldn't know. I didn't know that was a part of the simulation. I just walked into the room (laughs) and I got to the room and there were all these different activities and things set out and other people were like working diligently at their stations, doing their jobs. I didn't even know that was a part of the simulation, so I just did whatever I wanted to do and started doing puzzles and things along those lines. It was, I realized puzzles were actually something that was engaging. I could kind of do it and make it happen. Things like electronic devices were no good. TV was no good. We walked back out, and it was incredibly informing to be able to walk in someone else's shoes with something like dementia was so incredibly transformative. It was funny on the way out. This is a side note. I have to tell you. She said, I gave, everyone on our staff went through this training. Every one of our staff was given a job to do. And every one of the staff went into that room and did their job except two people. There were two people on our staff who didn't do any job and just did whatever they wanted. And those two people were Lance Marshall and Tim Brewster. (laughs) Because we just didn't know. And that is such a metaphor for what life at this church is like. (laughs) Our staff is just amening all over the room. (laughs) While we were doing that training, my grandmother, Dotsie, was 99 years old. Her sister, Patsy, was 92. Dotsie and Patsy, my whole life, have been a core part of my life. And Dotsie and Patsy had experienced advanced aging, and they were both experiencing signs of dementia. They were having differences in who they were and how they were able to communicate. I had had a chance through this training to actually walk a mile in their shoes. And for the first time ever, I was able to understand the difference between making eye contact and being in front of them and speaking loudly and clearly versus how isolated they felt when people were just talking around them and not making a real connection. Does that make sense? I saw the difference between how much fun it was for us to sit and do a puzzle together versus how alienating it was for us to sit and watch television together. I had a chance to actually have a little bit of experience in her shoes. And that compassion helped us connect and form a real engagement that transformed the last few years of our relationship together. Patsy made it to 93. Dotsie made it to 100. They're with the choir eternal now. I can't wait to see them again. And I'm so thankful for that exercise and how it helped me make a connection with them when we seemed like we would never be able to bridge it. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Isaiah. If you're one of our people who have the Bible open, um, I would encourage you to have it open. Uh, Brenda, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Would you tell me the page number again? It's 693. It's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. It's worth you opening it up, which is why I'm bringing all this up. 641. Thank you very much. I want to encourage you to actually open it up. So Isaiah is very close to the middle of your Bible. It's a book of the Hebrew Bible that is full of prophecy. And prophecy is not just predicting the future. It's proclaiming God's word to God's world. But this piece of scripture does have real prophecy in it, meaning it does explain something that is going to happen in the future. It's a vision that Isaiah gives of a transformed creation, a creation whose previous qualifying characteristics had been things like division and conflict 
and violence and hatred. Of course, that exists in humanity, but Isaiah wants to make clear that this is a vision that extends all throughout the natural world. And it will be undone, he says. It will be remade. It will be transformed. It will be set right. And the reason that I'm having you actually open your Bibles and see where this lands in the Scripture is because this is an incredibly powerful promise of good news given to us in Isaiah chapter 11. And it only comes when you fully embrace the devastation in Isaiah chapter 10. If you look just a page before, you'll be able to pull out key words. The devastation, the condemnation, the violence, the division, the hopelessness that has consumed the people of Israel. Their communities falling apart. Their nations falling apart. Their world is falling apart. They're coming to ask the question, are we still favored? Are God's promises still true? Is God's work still, at going, is still active in us and through us and for us? Or has it all come to nothing? Is our prosperity, is God's work, is it all over forever? They're devastated. They're torn apart. Torn apart. They're hopelessly divided. And that's when the Christ enters the story. The beginning of chapter 11, from the stump of Jesse's tree, meaning even though the Davidic promise that they've come to rely and hold central to their lives of God's work leading their community through the tribe of David and his people seems to have been cut off, it is still fruitful. And from that comes the child who will lead them, the one with perfect knowledge and perfect justice, who will actually reveal what the world is actually like, will come to the people. And that's where today's scripture reading comes in after the devastation through the work of the Christ child then comes the remaking of all things true compassion true connection true peace true heaven it will happen chapter 11 18 times it will it will it will it will it will will. It will. Part of the Methodist connection of the Christian family tree has been the firm conviction that it will come to pass. The salvation, the restoration, the reconciliation, and the healing that happens in our souls every day and will go on someday to perfection by the will and the grace of Christ. And the salvation and the reconciliation and the restoration and the healing that is happening in relationships and in churches and in cultures and in nations and in communities and in the world will happen, will come to full restoration someday, and we want to be a part of it. If this is where all of creation is heaven is headed, won't we be some of the ones who work for it? And so... The good news that we've received in Christ isn't just something for our own internal life that makes us feel better, gives us direction, peace, purpose, and understanding, but it's something that compels us to be and make a difference in the world. And that is why we do. And that is why even when things are hard and even when people are difficult and even when disagreement is deep and profound and understandable, we don't give up. And that is where compassion comes in. When I talk about compassion, in the context of today's message, what I mean is putting yourself in the shoes of other people. And what I want to invite you to do, to whatever extent you're willing to trust me, is to put yourself as best you can in the shoes of people who disagree with you politically. It was a really nice day on Monday. The weather was really nice. Um, It was really pleasant. And so... uh, my dogs got a much longer walk than they're, they're used to. They were like, we're still doing this? We're still going? Okay, buddy, feeling good? Or get bad news from the doctor. Which one is it? Because those are the two. <laughs> and I went on a walk, that, a, a path through our neighborhood that I don't normally go on. And I saw some houses in my neighborhood I don't normally see, kind of down some cul-de-sacs and things like that. And I didn't know, but in my neighborhood, um, I have two next-door neighbors um, who are both politically active and fans of flags, like big old flags, (laughs) 
Like they're the kind of people who I think they've like made foundation adjustments to their house in order to support the flags. These are people who saw flags that are eight feet big and they're like, mm, we can go bigger. Um, and you're not gonna believe this. I don't think they see things the same way. I'm kind of wondering who got into big flags first. <laughs> or was it at the same time? I don't know. I don't know their story. What I hope is that as neighbors, they've had some connection, some capacity, some willingness to talk to each other. Not to try to form an agreement, because I don't think that's going to be possible, but rather to say, why is it that you feel the way that you feel? What have you experienced that makes you see this as the best solution, not only for yourself, but for other people too? What have you experienced? What's your life been like? What have you seen that makes this conviction, to your understanding, the best thing, not only for you, but also for others? Because I bet that's how they both feel. I bet they both think this is what's best for me and what's best for others. Have they had the conversation to actually understand how each other feels? Or do they just drive by each other's driveways and project the worst possible motivations, the most uh, cartoonish characteristic of each other's beliefs onto each other? Or have they actually gone through the effort to try to understand why they think what they think is good for themselves and for others? I have someone that I know really well who experienced real devastation in their life via the illness of a loved one. Their loved one became ill and needed treatment. And this happened at an intersection of the availability of health care with health insurance and their ability to have funds in the United States where the intersection of how we provide health care and what it costs and the kind of treatment this person needed and what they were capable of doing bankrupted their family. An illness just happened out of nowhere. The insurance companies weren't able to cover the gaps. They had been playing by the rules. They had been doing the right things. And the end result for their family was getting the health care that they needed, also bankruptcy, financial devastation. That person that I know and love, love will vote for anybody with any plan that tries to alleviate for other people the pain and suffering that their family experienced. They will support any candidate and any policy that aims to alleviate the pain and suffering that they experienced. I'm not saying that's right or effective, but you can understand, right? How someone who suffered in that way would want to support anything that stopped other people from suffering in the same way. I also know two people who have lived in a community where all of the medical care was provided for and paid for by the national government of where they lived. One person was an ordinary citizen. One person was my surgeon. When I was going through my experience of having cancer in my chest cavity and eating a thoracic surgeon to go through that process, uh, my uh, surgeon was British. And he also wore pinstripes to suits. And it's like a little too on the nose, buddy. <laughs> and we were talking about uh, what was going on because it happened to be in a time in our national discourse when people were discussing the Affordable Health Care Act and things like that, that was on the news. And he was from England. And so I was asking him about it. His perspective as a recipient and a practitioner of health care in a community in which all of it is done through the state is that is terrible. I cannot tell you how inefficient and wasteful and unhelpful it is as a recipient of health care and as a practitioner. And I would never, ever, ever vote for something like that to happen in this place. My other friend who's had the experience of living in a system like that feels exactly the same way. I don't know which one is right. I don't know which one is a better plan. They do not teach you that in Bible school. They are both motivated to vote and to support candidates based on opposing visions and practices and policies around health care. But both of them, given their life experiences, their perspectives make sense to them. 
And they want nothing more than the well-being for themselves and all of the people they love. They will disagree till their dying day. And truthfully, one group may be more right than the other. I don't know which. But I do know that both of them want nothing more than themselves and their families and their entire communities healthy and happy and whole. And they want nothing more than their physicians to be able to practice and to care for and to heal and to live into the calling that God gave them. My question is, will they give each other enough chance to hear their story and understand where they're coming from? Will they have the compassion to actually listen, to walk a mile in their shoes? And even though they will most likely never agree or have their minds changed, will they care enough to not find out and say, well, given what you've experienced, and what you've seen to be true in your life, I understand that you think that is the best thing for you and for other people. And even though we disagree, I understand. Can you practice that kind of compassion? Can you receive that kind of compassion? Can you live that kind of compassion with people who have flags and stickers and Facebook posts with which you very much disagree? Are you willing to actually ask and hear the story that has led them to think, this is what's best for me and for other people? And are you willing to be so vulnerable as to share yourself? Because actually living and loving and being kind and being compassionate has the real capacity for change. And that's where I'm going to end today because the thing about which I'm most self-conscious in this entire message series is not the fear that you'll really strongly disagree with me as that, you know, this isn't what a Christian should do or this isn't the right thing to do. My fear is that you'll think I'm just being too naive. My concern is that you'll think, oh, this kindness, this compassion, this love, that's sweet, but things are real out here, dude. You know, you, Lance, don't actually live in the real world. You just preach down here, and then you go up into the tower, and you sleep for six days, and then you come back down. <laughs> you don't know what life is actually like in the real world. And what I'll just say is, is there are stories over and over and over again from all around the world that show that this is the actual way to actual change. The one that I'll share very briefly today comes out of the post-apartheid reality in South Africa. For those of you who are my age or a little bit older, you had a chance to live through the apartheid regime in South Africa. A, a very quick and insufficient summary is that a very small community of people who were white, who were mostly descended from Western European colonialists, had a great deal of oppressive power and authority over the vast majority of the population that was native African, that were black-skinned, and that were from the communities that lived there. And at some point, the pressure became just too much where that white group was led out of power. The question now becomes, what do we do to them who were oppressing us? What do we do to them who created so much pain? What do we do to them who had led such an immoral and awful regime for generation upon generation upon generation, who had so hopelessly denigrated ourselves, our wives, our husbands, and our children? What do we do to them now? South Africa went through a process called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu is an amazing Christian leader, one of my favorite folks, and it's really hard to find a picture of him where he's not making a hilariously joyous face. This is like the only serious picture of him I could find. He led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was all about telling the real stories of the real people and what actually happened and to charting a path for forgiveness. It required people who had been oppressed to hear the stories of their oppressors. It required the people who had oppressed to hear the stories of those that they had victimized. It asked them all to walk a mile in their shoes and to step past an endless cycle of retaliation that would just leave everybody dead. He wrote a book called God Has a Dream. He wrote, when we see others as the enemy, we risk becoming what we hate. Let's say that again. When we see others as the enemy, we risk becoming what we hate. When we oppress others, we end up oppressing ourselves. All of our humanity is dependent on recognizing the humanity in others. 
walking a mile in their shoes, opening ourselves to their experience. All of our humanity is dependent on recognizing the humanity in others. A person becomes a person because they recognize others as persons. It is through weakness and vulnerability that most of us learn empathy and compassion with others and discover our soul. This isn't just an excerpt from a nice book. These are words of wisdom from a community of people that led a community of millions off the edge of an endless cycle of death, destruction, and violence and towards the possibility of a new world, and it started with compassion. So, may we be so bold as to trust and believe that the Spirit of Christ that will reconcile all people to each other might also be at work in us today. And as we do so, may we boldly pray. Would you pray with me? Great loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, we ask today for a spirit, for a strength, for a willingness to be compassionate towards others, to try to understand their life story, their experiences, their perspectives, how it is they have come to believe that what they think, what they desire, what they hope for the future is in their best interests and for the best interests of all people. Lord, we can't all be equally right. Not all paths are equally fruitful. Not all provide equal justice and equal mercy and equal flourishing for all people, but help us to understand your people as desiring your good for your world. Lord, help us work towards it, not just as individuals, but as part of your church. And Lord, as we pray, we pray responsively. As I lead us, may the congregation join us in saying together for ourselves and others. Join me in this prayer. We pray for healing for ourselves and others. We pray for belonging for ourselves and others. We pray for the spiritual capacity for compassion for ourselves and others. And we pray for the ability to walk a moment in the lives and shoes of others for ourselves and others. And believing boldly in the reconciling and restoring work of Christ together as a church, we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite forward those who will be assisting with the serving of communion today, I do so with the reminder that the ultimate act of compassion, the ultimate act of bridging a gap that seems unbridgeable was provided by Christ himself. On the day he was to give himself up for us, he, someone who had never experienced sin, he, someone who had never wavered from the path of righteousness, he, who was someone who had never failed to live up to the perfect ideal of what is good for himself and for all people, instead made the connection with us on his journey to the cross and wanting to make sure that, he, that we understood that he was bringing us with him. He took an ordinary loaf of bread, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so as we eat the bread and drink the juice, we do so uniting ourselves with the one who overcame all distances between us and the life that God makes possible. In just a moment, beginning in the rear of the room, the ushers will release you row by row. As you come forward with your hands held open like this, we'll have uh, two stations on each side. The interior station has um, pre-cut bread and pre-filled juice cups. Uh, you take the bread, you, you take the cup, you eat the bread, you drink the juice, and you head down your outside aisle. The exterior rows have intinction. It's the more old school way of doing it. They'll tear a piece off the loaf and you'll dip it into the cup. Sacramentally, it's the same. There's a pre-COVID and a post-COVID way of doing it. So do whichever way is most comfortable for you. Those in the balcony, you're welcome to come down to the floor. We also have a station for you up on the east side of the balcony. This is not the gatherings table. 
First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table, like his life, like his love, like his grace, like the fullness of his bringing to be the world that is promised to us in Isaiah chapter 11. It is for all people. It is for you today. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward and be fed.
called us one and all. Christ has broken down the wall. I just want to remind you that after this and every service, we have someone at the Welcome Center who would love to say hello to you. Right there on the on-ramp, if you have any questions about life at this church, getting connected, becoming a member, being baptized, anything like that, we would love to help get you connected right there. If you are a first-time visitor or guest, we have a gift for you as well as for any kids that may be with you this morning. Over here, we have someone at our care, Congregational Care Ministries. Um, we would love to have a chance to pray with you. If there's anything going on in your life or in your family or in the life of someone you love that would benefit from prayer, please don't just walk out the doors. Let us join you in praying and lifting up whatever is on your heart this morning. Would you now please bow your heads and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise and shine upon you. And may kindness and love and compassion and open-heartedness tear down any wall that exists in your heart between you and family, you and neighbor, you and friend, and help you and all others step into a new creation of peace and harmony this and every day. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.